Um, well, first of all, I'm very honoured to be invited to come and speak here. Uh, so thank you very much. Um, I'm going to talk about this large soprano pipistrel that is Pygmaeus roosts in Scotland. Um, this is Scotland, still part of the UK. <laughs> um, so there's, there's no particular reason that I've cut off England here. <laughs> Just the way the map came up. Um, and I'm talking about soprano pipistrels. Uh, we have both soprano and common pipistrels, and they are found throughout the UK and throughout Scotland, apart from the Shetlands. Now, the Shetlands should be up there somewhere, um, but for the sake of this map, they're down there. This is the Orkneys. Um, these are the Outer Hebrides, and these are the only places that you don't get soprano pipistrel in Scotland. So the Inner Hebrides, that's these islands like Skye and Mull and... Uh, Isla, and even this, this one, Rum, and some of these other islands. They all have soprano pipistrels. Um, and in many parts of Scotland, they are the common pipistrel. So we still use the word, the name common pipistrel, but it's a bit of a misnomer for that. Um, I think before I ask that, I'm going to take a leaf from uh, Aunt AJ's book and ask, I think, three questions. First of all, hands up if you like bats. <laughs> I'm just looking to see some people actually don't have their hands up. <laughs> okay, second question. Would you like bats to be living in your own home? <laughs> very good, very good. How about a thousand bats in your own home? <laughs> Also very good. Now, I think we have a biased sample here. <laughs> um, because many of the people that I get to speak to are not so keen on having bats in their home. Never mind a thousand bats, but even a hundred bats sounds horrific to many people. Um, because, let's be honest, if you have a lot of bats um, in your roof somewhere, they can cause problems. Um, noise. Uh, I'm sure most, of, most people here have heard the exciting chittering noises and the scratching noises, the scrabbling noises as the bats are, are moving about. Now, a little bit further north than here in Scotland, in the, in the summer, um, at midsummer, sunset is after 10 o'clock, where I am. Even further north in Scotland, I'm sort of in the middle somewhere. Um, further north in Scotland, it's even later, and it doesn't really get dark at all. Now, the bats, the soprano pipistrels come out from about that time, about 10 o'clock, even earlier if it's a large roost. So they're out half an hour before sunset. Um, and then these soprano pipistrels, if this is a nursery roost and they have young, then they start coming back in at midnight. Um, and they're moving around, so they're coming in and going out. They're active at that time. They're noisy, squeaking, scrabbling noises. Um, and this goes on until sunrise. Now, sunrise, midsummer, is 3.30, 4 o'clock in the morning. Most honest people are sleeping. Not bad people, maybe, but <laughs> honest people. Um, and... Even after the bats, even after sunrise, you know, they, they're moving around, there's noise, so there can be noise all night. So you have to have some sympathy for people with large numbers of bats for that reason. Smell. Soprano pipistrels are stinking bats in large numbers. I mean, I have gone into a roof space, which is used for storage by the family, and it stinks. You're knocked back by the smell of ammonia. And the, and the uh, husband in the family says, I can't come up there, I'm allergic to uh, the, the, this smell. You know, I react against it, asthma. Um, but this is a family who have lived with this number of bats, over 2,000, for 
um, 10 years. I should go back, um, sorry, I should go back to that one and just point out when I'm talking about large soprano pipistrelle roofs, I'm talking about something, say, bigger than 500. That's pretty large. Bigger than 1,000 is not uncommon throughout the range. And what I forgot to point out was that uh, these are the around about 2,000 level soprano pipistrelle roofs. And I emphasize these are all in houses and they're all occupied by families. Okay, so what are the problems? Droppings, great if you, if you can uh, be organic about it and say these droppings are fantastic fertilizer, you clean them out every so often if you can get at them and you can use them on the garden. Um, I, had a, I used to be a teacher and I had a colleague being a, of a bit of a scientific thinking, mind you, I was a chemist, but, um, and he, he had put back droppings on his cabbages so he had one cabbage, bat droppings, no, none on the next one, one bat droppings, none on the next one. I haven't still got the photograph, but there was a beautiful photograph he took afterwards, big cabbage, small cabbage, big cabbage, small cabbage. And the big cabbage, that's where the bat droppings were. So scientific proof, it works. Um, stray bats. Okay, uh, you know, we, we all, I'm sure are quite happy to pick up a bat and examine it and poke it and, and then release it. Uh, but not everybody is, and people get quite um, distressed about these, these bats. So they have stray bats flying around, they have stray bats in their bedrooms even at night. They have the smell, the noise, they're kept awake. That doesn't really contribute to good feeling towards the bats. If people are not getting enough sleep, people get very irritable and unhappy and, and if, if I'm the bat person that comes along to give advice, I get it, you know, um, and I take it, you know, that's, that's one of the things you're there for, just to listen and sympathize and try and empathize. Um, and then there's the parasites and other, other insects, I say. Um, I, I don't know how common people find this, but in large Soprano pipistrelle roos, I find this not uncommonly. This is the golden spider beetle, I can't tell you what the scientific name is. Um, but they're harmless little beetles, and actually they're very pretty little beetles. But their larvae live in um, organic detritus. So they will live in birds' nests as well as um, uh, bat droppings. But, and, they're, and they're fairly common, but if you get them breeding in the large quantities of droppings, then they have a dispersal phase. And these little insects just are found everywhere. Have you heard of Glen Eagles? The hotel, very famous hotel. They have golf, golf matches, they have courses, matches. They, uh, they had a, the G8 summit there a few years back, that sort of thing. They have spider beetles in their posh bedrooms, on the bed sheets. You know, not so, not so, people are not so keen on that sort of thing. Um, they're, I'd say they're harmless, and you clear out the bat droppings every so often, and that usually sorts it out. Um, but they, you know, they just get everywhere, and not everybody likes little insects in their beds. Um, and then, even, sorry, even less pleasant, if you can see these, uh, how many of you have come across uh, the, the bat tick, a little flat circular tick? How many come across that? Well, they, they are found in well-established um, bat roosts, well, pipistrel bat roosts anyway. Um, I'm not sure what other species they're, they're found in, but I've only found them in soprano pipistrel roosts. But that's because they tend to have the largest roosts and the largest quantities. They are slow-moving, are unlikely to get a grip of you, but you know, if you find them in your room in, and squash them, they're usually full of blood and people imagine... That that's not very nice. Um, they might bite me. I, I, I don't think they do. But the, the next one, the, the, the bat bug, Simex pipistrelli, does bite. Um, and they're, they're just like bed bugs. How many, another question, how many have experienced or admit to having experienced bed bugs at some time? I don't believe you. 
I don't believe the people that haven't had their ha hands up. You probably didn't know you were being bitten by these. But uh, they're quite common in hotel rooms. Behind, If you ever had a, 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 a bed, bed in with these studs, then you should look behind these and see if you find any little creepy crawlies. But they are, they are found in all, all sorts of places. And um, they're not on, So this is the bed bug. But the bat bug is, is equally able to bite. And if, in my experience, if people find these in their houses, um, that's usually the end of the bat roost. They want, they, they want rid of them. Um, and then there's other parasites. Fleas, well, fortunately, bat fleas don't, are sort of weak things. They don't jump and they don't bite people. Um, uh, then there's the Debentance bat has uh, bat, bat flies. Um, Debentance bat, in my experience, in the UK anyway, doesn't have any fleas, but it has this bat fly, which are like little six-legged spiders. They scuttle about in the fur. And again, I don't think these actually bite humans, but they're not terribly pleasant. So that's it. Bats have... Uh, Soprano pipistrelles have their friends um, and you know there's the list of things that you may or may not find acceptable if you've been living with these for a few years okay so Scottish natural heritage which is the Scottish equivalent of natural England um, um, Wales changed its name recently what does anybody tell me what natural resources, natural resources Wales thank you and of course, Northern Ireland, there's somebody here from Northern Ireland, has its own agency. Northern Ireland Environment Agency. Okay, so these are all basically the four different UK uh, organisations for nature conservation. And, well, government advisors. Um, and in 1998, um, SNH. Uh, collaborated with a, a, a firm of architects and came up with designs for bat boxes which would be used in buildings to try and contain and therefore man manage the problem of uh, large soprano pipistrelles roofs in particular. Not only those, but that essentially is the, um, the problem species. Um, but these designs were not really tested. Uh, they were the sort of best that people could come up with at the time. And in the next, well, around about that time and in the next few years, there was various attempts to contain bats within buildings, um, again, to try and manage them. And in 2001, Bat Conservation Trust, uh, that's the UK Bat Conservation Trust, I think we should have uh, the two BCT um, staff members stand up just, just to sh show themselves and just embarrass you, yes. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, Bat Conservation Trust was commissioned to do a survey. Basically, it was, it was the, the, main, um, the main part of the study was to look at the effect effectiveness of advice generally to householders in Scotland. But as part of it, they wanted to look at nine examples of bat, bo bat boxes in houses where SNH had actually had some input. It may just be design input, but in some cases it was quite a bit of money as well. And, and I was the field officer at that time, 2001, uh, who spent the summer collecting the information and visiting these, these bat boxes. But as I say, that was just one small part of the, the general study. Um, the reason for it, actually, was to do with foot and mouth. You know what foot and mouth is? I don't. In disease in cattle, well, uh, 2001 was a big outbreak of foot and mouth in the uh, in the UK, and there was real clampdown on anything that you could do in the countryside. So what actually happened was SNH found itself with money to spend on research, but they couldn't do the usual things involving getting into the countryside, so they had to think up other things. And this is one of the ones that came up with. Um, but it, it wasn't actually published until 2006. This is presumably what you're referring to when you um, mentioned this. 
Um, but by 2006, it was still out of date, really. So what I'm going to talk about for the rest of the time uh, is a couple of examples. This was one of the examples that um, appeared in this report in 2006. But, as I say, the field work was done in 2001, and the bat box was only created and uh, built in the year 2000, so only a year before. And in the report, if you read it, you will see this is a failure. It was put in in 2000, at the beginning of 2000, no bats occupied it in 2000, no bats occupied it in 2001. I actually remember going there and helping the local bat group count the bats. None came out of the, the bat box area, um, and 68 came out of an old shed in the garden. That was about it. Um, so this, went, this is going down from... I, uh, it's difficult to pin down the figures, but I was told that in the 90s, at one time, it was up to 2,500. Um, but in, immediately before the box, it was around about um, 1,000. Um, June 1999, yeah, it was... Again, I couldn't get an exact figure, but it, it was 950 to 1,000. Now, the box... Uh, nice big house, okay... Um, and the box is here. So it was built into this house, into the roof. Um, if I go back just to this, um, actually, sorry, um, there were access to, for the bats all over the roof. So, you know, this is typical of, of the sort of thing that was done contain them in one area. Yes, you probably won't get as many bats as before, but that's not a bad thing if you're the, the householder living there and having to put up with these bats all over the place. Um, but the idea was to, to contain them in one area in this area of the roof. Okay? And I wasn't involved in the design. This is before, my, before I was involved in this. Uh, it was actually... Uh, some, somebody you may know, Bob Stebbings, and some of you will know anyway. Bob Stebbings and uh, Morris Weber. Morris Weber actually did the, did the work. He was the builder, uh, but helped with the design of this. And this is where it is, approximately. So it's a three-meter-long box by 120 centimeters wide uh, by about 80 or 90 centimeters high. So it's a triangular cross-section box fitting into the... Um, into the eaves there. So you've got to imagine the house, straight walls like this, and the roof, and you've got the triangular roof space. And what has happened, what happens in many houses, you build up into the roof space. So you build up into the roof space, so you have uh, a, ro a room which is a sloping ceiling at the side, and then um, short walls at the eaves. Okay, so you have this little triangular space in the eaves. Five minutes, okay. Um, so the, uh, the bats come in and out mainly from the end here. And you can see the staining there. That photograph was taken just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, staining, lots of dropping. So that's the main entrance for about two-thirds of the bats. Um, and the other entrance was actually in a, a sort of uh, artificial slate made out of lead and fitted in instead of the slates there. Um, and as I say, 2001, no bats there. And the house was sold in 2002. So a new family moved in, nobody told the new family about the bats. And remember, there weren't any bats in 2001, 2002. So it wasn't for a few years that they realized that they actually had bats there. Now, this is, the, this is looking at the, um, the box from the crawl space that you have to go along to get to it. Um, that there... Oh, go back, go back, go back. That there is actually a little sort of chute so that any, any bats that happen to find themselves somewhere around the roof can actually get into the box. So the idea is it allows bats into the box, but not out again. How effective it is it, I don't know, but it's one of 
Bob Stebbing's ideas. Um, and if you open the box, this is lowering down that end, then this is what you see inside. Now, in this light, you won't see that, that there's a lot of bat droppings on the floor there. But this structure here is the heater. So it's a heated bat box. It was a, a water heater diverted from the water supply. Uh, sorry, you know, the, the central heating water supply in the house. Um, the people who moved into this house knew nothing about it, and they, um, they disconnected that. Okay? But in spite of that, well, what, what they did was actually put in a more efficient geothermal heating system. And the um, bats seemed to have moved back in fairly big numbers. This is 2009 when I was there to help them with their spider beetle problem. And this is end-to-end -end droppings. Not too thick, but a lot of droppings there. Um, this is a couple of weeks ago, or less than, less than a couple of weeks ago, I visited there. And this time, the droppings are five centimeters deep at this end, and they're twice that at the far end. Um, a lot of droppings. All this white, flecky material is because they're, they're actually hanging on that, some of that insulation, and they're wearing away some of the insulation there. So this is the, um, this is the conclusion. Uh, and again, we come, come back to the sort of slightly human problem. The local bat group who counted, counted the bats couldn't find their data. I asked them earlier in the summer. They said they'd provide it um, it's somewhere in a computer somewhere. Um, but all we can say is that the numbers are back up to what they were before the box was put in. So this year, certainly, we know that there was 926 counted in June. A good number. Um, okay. Move on to, quickly to a more recent example, which I was involved in. Um, families lived here for 21 years until this year. Um, not a very big house, smaller house in Perthshire, more towards the east of Scotland. And this is a, a roost that's been well counted for uh, the National Bat Monitoring Programme. And you can see that numbers peaked, 1,252, but you know, more recently, around about 500 bats. But it's a small roof space, and they were causing problems. So these are the sort of problems, the smell, the staining to the ceiling, uh, spider beetles, damage to plumbing. And the solution was to try and get a, a bat box built in. This is an example of what, we, what was discovered when they took away some of the droppings, and the, there was this leaking, corroded copper pipe. Um, so this year, the work began on the roof in April. Um, I was there just to basically uh, find any bats that were in there, because they were hibernating in there. The bats are using the, the little gaps under the slates, the way it's constructed. Um, and you can also see this, in, this material, this uh, roofing felt was put back was replaced 15 years ago, and the bats have actually worn holes through it. Um, this is continuing along, cl uh, clearing out the stuff, and this is starting to, to make the bat box. Now, the bat box, um, because of the, uh, the way the roof is constructed, the bat box has two elements to it. One, I call it a ramp, but it's actually a narrow bat box going up to the main box at the top. Um, and this is, a, if you like, this is a cross section through a bit of the roof. There's the wall plate, that's the bit of wood that sits on top of the wall which supports the rafters. Sarking boards are the boards that, are, that cover a Scottish roof, or Scottish or Northern, Eng Northern England roof, uh, under the slates. Um, and it's just showing there's a, a hole where bats could actually crawl the whole length of the top of the wall, even if they were in, entering one little place. So here's constructing the sort of ramp structure, or making the grooves for the bats to climb up more easily. Uh, I look as if I'm doing some work there, but again, I just emphasize I'm there to just catch the bats and uh, do the occasional smoothing job in the cement. Um, but that, that shows you the sort of structure. The bats uh, can enter here, crawl up there, and they can use that space and also get into the roof. 
That's looking up at one of the entrances that are left. So they get in under the gutter and then up. Um, and uh, this is finishing it off, putting back sarking boards to make this gap of about three centimeters uh, where they can use. And, uh, and we move on to what's inside the roof. Beautiful, clean roof once the droppings are removed. Uh, the box there, inside of the box, looking down into the ramp there. Um, and all finished in April, counted in June, no bats emerged from the bat box. Um, but the, this is pointing to where the entrance to the bat box is and the area of the bat box in that red circle. Most of the bats were here or going in through a hole in the stonework, getting down in the back of the, um, the wall there. And this bedroom, I'll point out, this is a teenage daughter, born in 2000, and uh, now 14. And the whole, one of the whole points of this was to try and get the bats away from Rosie's bedroom. Actually, they're all round her bedroom now. Um, August, and, uh, oh, move on. Went back there just recently to have a look inside. The egg, bo egg boxes are there to soak up the urine, and uh, they would certainly show up if there's any droppings at all. No bats using the box. But if you go back to the first example, it's very early days. Finally, coming back to the, um, the human element, um, Oh, yeah, sorry, that's where most of the bats were. Back, the numbers were this, similar to two years ago when they were last counted, just about 500, um, but not in the, the box. Um, how long do you have to monitor a box to find whether it's successful or not? Um, and, and, yeah, this is the, the postscript. The house has now been sold to new owners, so we have to start all over again with the education. Thank you very much. We have, we have a few, a little time for a few questions. Have you tried to discourage the bats to use the, the entrances they used in the past? In this one? In any example? Any of them. Um, yes, but the first, the first stage is to present them with the, uh, the way I approach it, the first stage is to present them with a new box, but not entirely exclude, unless it's absolutely essential, unless it's a real problem. So in this case, as with the other house, these are very accommodating, very friendly people, very friendly towards the bats. And so, um, you know, we're not trying to get rid of the bats totally, but say, look, here's a new box. Um, if you want, you can use that and then at a later stage exclude them. And I think that's the, that's the approach that one should take. Sometimes you can't do that. Sometimes you have to say, right, that's it. That's your, that's your new home now. And, you know, goodbye to the old home. One more question. Well, I guess it's more or less the same question maybe, but why would uh, the bats prefer the box instead of their natural place? That's exactly it. And uh, going back to the first example, you know, 2001 it was declared a failure, but five years later they had adapted to it. Because uh, that was a situation where uh, actually the roof, the, the whole roof was re-roofed to, to seal out uh, the bats from anywhere else. So they did actually go totally they went to somewhere else nearby, but uh, they're now back. John, isn't it the case that this bat box and the other ones in the case of bats had used? Yes, part, you know, basically, instead of allowing them to use A, B, C, D, E areas within the roof, you restrict them to A. They've been using that area, and so you try and get them up to use that area only. Um, so, yeah, that, if that answers the question better, um, they, they were used, they were full, they, you know, a year ago, that space that I showed, nice and clean, was full of bats. 
And in fact, there were the, there was some there in the winter, in in amongst the insulation. All that, was, all the old droppings, all the insulation was taken out. Um, they still have the access. They still have the same way in, but they just didn't use it. Too clean, too new, not smelly enough. Perhaps. Okay. Thank okay. you very much.